Welcome everybody to this LSE event. My name is Mary Caldor and I'm Professor Emeritus of Global Governance. I also direct the Conflict Research Programme at LSE Ideas. Um, so we're here because Leia Ippi, and here is her book, has written a really wonderful book. Um, it, it really reads like a novel. It's about her life. It reads like a novel. And yet it's incredibly complex and sophisticated in political terms. And it has you thinking about politics in general, but of course, and that's the aim of the book, the nature of freedom. So I'm going to hand over to Leia to introduce the book, and then I'll ask her a few questions and then please feel free to put questions uh, from the floor. I call it the floor, but it's not really a floor. It's a virtual space. And um, I'll try and pass them on to Leia. So Leia, welcome. Great. And I haven't said anything about you. Leia is Professor of Political Theory in the Government Department, which I think was very clever of them to appoint her. And uh, she was formerly at the CEU and at Nuffield, and she writes about Marx and other important critical ideas. So over to you, Leah. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Mary, for agreeing to join me in this conversation. I'm going to be very brief uh, and talk about the general themes of the book. I must also apologize in advance in case there are any problems with the line because I am connected for the first time from a hotel in Amsterdam which, where I've never been before and so I hope that it's all, all going to work out and not going to end up the usual Albanian or Balkan or East European way where there is an electricity or a line shortage or whatever. Um, so fingers crossed it's going to all keep going smoothly. Um, so the book is called Free, Coming of Age at the End of History, and the larger philosophical theme that animates it is the idea of freedom. And what the book tries to do is to explain what individual agency and responsibility look like when there are larger social constraints and structures of power that inhibit individual agency. So the book explores how this yearning for freedom is at the heart of all the choices and the dilemmas faced by the different characters who all have different conceptions of what freedom is and what it takes to realize it and who encounter these dilemmas as they try to navigate different political systems in a time of upheaval and transition and some of the characters are used to these transitions, like my grandmother, others, like me, are new to them. And the book is set in Albania, which is in many ways what mathematicians or political scientists or economists sometimes call a limit case. So a limit case is a case where you can test a particular component of a theory or a value in its extreme form. And it's also a limit because one sees how these ideas of freedom shape lives in different political systems in socialism and liberalism, which are uh, often presented as rivals to each other with a different ethos that characterizes each of them and with different sets of values. And in fact, we can talk later if you like about how I came to write this book in this particular way, but the initial motivation was to write a philosophical book about these ideas of freedom in the liberal and the socialist traditions, which then and institutions which then turned into the project that turned into free. So the book is written from the point of view of a young girl at the cusp of making the transition from childhood to adulthood and whose um, emotional, personal and cognitive evolution coincides with the evolution or rather the revolution of a peaceful revolution of her country from one political system to the other. And it's a coming of age story, both for the individual and for the country. And in both cases, it's a relatively traumatic coming of age story. So in the personal case, it's traumatic uh, 
because we learn the ideas of freedom and personal responsibility from our social environment. But in this case, the two main sites of influence, so the family on the one hand and the state, the state and the education system on the other, are in contrast with each other. And that's because the main character grows up in a dissident family without knowing it, and so is therefore equally subjected to the formative influence of the state and um, of the family. And so she's taught to be a good citizen and a good pioneer, but doesn't know that in her family that our secrets that are being conceived, uh, concealed and that, you know, her ancestors positioned themselves in different ways vis-a-vis -vis the system and uh, that, you know, there's difficult stories on both sides of her family. So I don't, I don't want to uh, reveal or spoil the plot unless you really want me to later. But basically, the main thrust of it is that the first part is this sort of progressive revelation of family secrets and mysteries. And, uh, and so, and in, and in every society that is divided by class, whether in socialism and in liberalism, which social class you come from shapes the opportunities that you have in the future. But in the case of this character, it was extreme because these different formative influences pulled in different directions. And that's also why, and I think I will just say this by way of ending uh, the summary of the book, why in the book there is no unified interpretation of the purposes and the motives of different characters, and there is no dominant narrative voice. It's all told from the point of view of this child that observes reality and conveys impressions on reality, but there is no attempt to have this main character, in a way, be the main character in terms of projecting a narrative on the book. There is rather an effort to show how these different stories shape the self-understanding of someone who grows up in that context where different things go on at once, and to try and explain a way how that person then grows to be an adult and how that shapes the way in which that adult then sees the world and how they position themselves vis-a-vis -vis different um, systems and different ideologies and the criticism that one might generate from in, in both of these cases. So I think I'll just stop there. Well, that's in itself very interesting because you talk about the book as though it's not you. <laughs> and so actually, uh, and that, I, I mean, of course it reads as though it's you, but it does read like a novel rather than like an autobiography. And what I wonder is to what extent did you, is, is it a novel? I mean, I'm sure everything really happened, but the dialogue you must have had to reproduce and reinvent. So is it sort of a mixture between a novel and an autobiography? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so what happened was that from the period from 1990 onwards, I kept diaries very, uh, very detailed diaries. And especially they, they were diaries that were trying to record political events in part as a result of this confusion that um, I was experiencing at the time, which had to do with being told different things from different sites. And so my family was saying one thing about what was going on. I had my own impressions and the school, other things were being said in school. And so in part, and I, that was also the time in which I started to think and write creatively. So I was writing poetry and short stories and so on. So I have a very uh, detailed record in the diary of these days in 1990 where things were changing, which is what helped me when I wrote the story to go back and see how I was really living events at the time and to reinforce this memory that I had, which was that I felt very confused and that I didn't, I had not endorsed one narrative or the other. It was rather a moment of, of shaking of convictions and so on. And then the way in which I reconstructed the stories in the two different parts of the book. So the first part of the book covers my childhood in communist Albania and some of the episodes that I talk about are from very early on. So from the age of five, let's say in nursery or when, when I started schools around about just, just before six and then other stories that develop a little bit later, all of them were events that I remembered happening. One thing, for example, that I talk about in one of the early chapters about the death of Enver Hoxha, the um, Albanian communist historic leader uh, in 1985 died. And every child in Albania has a very clear memory of what happened that day, how they were told about the death, where they were, what the adult said about it, what the family, how the family responded and so on. And there were several events like that, which helped me reconstruct the initial sort of early events of childhood. And of course, some of it is of course fictionalized. So the dialogue and the detail and all of that would be more of a reconstruction 
a kind of literary reconstruction rather than an exact reconstruction of events. But the main events and the reason why these main events are there is that I had these very clear impressions from my childhood of having experienced the event in a certain way or for example, um, during the funeral of Hoja, I remembered my family really standing in front of the television and talking about the music and me being really perplexed as to why on this really sad day, everyone was just, you know, seemed to be interested in music and they weren't responding in the way in which I was expecting them to respond. So there were these glimpses throughout my childhood of this contrast between how I was expecting them to respond to certain events and how they ended up responding, which caused the confusion and uncertainty, which and the mysteries in a way that weren't really clear to me how they fit together. But there were these mysteries of my childhood that I wasn't sure about. And uh, I didn't know how to explain the fact that people were talking French to me, for example, that my grandfather, right, my grandmother was speaking French to me or that people talked about universities all the time. And the family members seemed to spend a lot of time at university that they dropped out, they did this, they went, they studied this degree or that degree that this was very important to the narrative of uh, during communism of who our family was that there were lots of family members that went to university, basically. So all these secrets, I, I remembered the impression that they had left on me. And I remembered, as I say, some key moments, but then the reconstruction of the dialogue and the atmosphere and what happens, that's much more using uh, literary techniques, in part because I've always been inspired by literature that is talks about politics and deals with universals in some way that is philosophical, mm -hmm. but that also reaches to the readers via this more emotional and different sort of aesthetic route, I suppose, from how political theory tries to reach so and then with the second part of the book it was very different because for the second part I had very detailed diaries so most of the things that I reconstructed I had already described in those terms in the diary and although I wrote it with the voice of um, someone who is obviously also the, the person that I am now it was much it was easier because the, there was much more detail in the diaries whereas with the first part I did it with a mix of interviews and watching documentaries from the period or reading the media or reading the newspapers combined with personal recollections and stories and yeah so, so uh, different. that's really interesting and explains why it reads so wonderfully actually I loved the diary bit which comes later in the book when you talk about the civil war um but we can come to that later I think the theme of the book, obviously, and you said that already, but I'd kind of like to unpack it a bit more, is your understanding of freedom, which you, in a way, developed through the book. But there are two dominant ideas of freedom. One is the freedom that you're taught about at school, and you have this wonderful teacher called Miss Nora, <laughs> who... Um, and you get an idea of communist freedom. And of course, the other is the freedom that you're told you have after the fall of communism. Could you say a bit more about what those, they were unfreedoms in a way, but you turn them into freedoms in the book. So uh, there's several characters, all the characters in the book all have their different ideas of freedom. And in part, the effort in the book was to talk about freedom by talking about or, or to rather use the characters and to explore these different ideas of freedom by telling the stories of these different characters and um, explaining their commitments and so on. And so, uh, you know, just to give you a quick roundup, I guess, for people who haven't read the book of there's, I guess, five crucial characters, some some seem more important than others, but there's the people in my family. So my mother, my father and my grandmother, each of which have a different idea of freedom in a way. And then in each part of the book, there is also an outside character that I guess embodies the idea of freedom of the system in which they live in its most dogmatic form. And so in the communist part, there is this teacher called Nora, who is my moral education teacher. And she has the sort of communist ideals and talks about communist ideals and what a socialist society needs to do to realize and to turn into a communist society, because the idea is that you're a society in transition from socialism, which is an imperfect form of freedom to communist freedom, where the state really withers away. And then the second part of the book, there is a character that is also quite central, although he comes up uh, in, in some of the latter chapters, who is called the crocodile, or rather his nickname is the crocodile. His real name is Vincent van der Berg, and he's an employee of the World Bank who comes to Albania and is in charge of bringing the structural reforms that were at that point being brought to uh, all the East European societies in transition in an effort to kind of help them achieve this liberal freedom 
And so again, the Nora teacher and the crocodile are two dialectical sort of philosophical opposites in a way, but also similar in their uh, commitment to the systems in which they live without really questioning them, them critically. And so there's these different ideas of freedom. On the one hand, my mother has what you might call this more classical liberal idea of negative freedom, which is freedom from. So you are free to the extent that nobody stops you from uh, doing things such as traveling or dressing in a certain way or saying certain things in public. And this animates all her struggles in the book, both how you understand that freedom and how, rela how you relate to authority. And so he's also very skeptical of the role of the state and interventions by the state in all cases. And, uh, and it also animates the kind of the struggles of the country when it emerges from state socialism and tries to unpack this uh, liberal idea of freedom. And on the other hand, my father has this more um, social idea of freedom, which is what you know, philosophers call positive freedom, that's to say freedom too, which is that it's not enough to be stopped from doing certain things because you are only free if you have certain opportunities to realize yourself. And his dilemmas become particularly relevant in the second part of the book, which is about liberalism, where the fortunes of the family are in some ways turned. And uh, with the end of communism, they end up being on the side of victors rather than victims. And my father is personally rewarded by becoming a CEO who then has to fire workers for the sake of, um, of structural reform. And that's sort of deeply disturbing from him because he seems he feels he begins to see himself as someone who is um, responsible. And on the other hand, um, these other two mar more marginal characters, Nora on the one hand and the crocodile on the other, they are the kind of human embodiment of both the ideals, but also the ideological delusions that characterize these two systems and that divide the book. So the end of state socialism and uh, liberalism on the other hand. So Nora is my moral education teacher. She's committed party member who hasn't, you know, never washed her hands or says she hasn't washed her hands for days after meeting and <laughs> And she believes that Albania has this mission to guide the world in this transition from socialism to communism. And she articulates that perspective and that conception of freedom in her moral education lessons where she gives you Albania's perspective on the outside world. So the fact, for example, that the, both the Soviet Union and China are considered sellouts who have abandoned true socialism and where, you know, what she articulates is this kind of state socialist perspective on a number of issues. So liberal freedom is just formal equality before the law, but doesn't really help uh, this disadvantaged and sort of oppressed social classes or the fact that liberal societies are torn by racial injustices and she has this kind of contempt for money where she talks about the extraction of surplus value on workers and she talks about the kind of ideological role of religion in terms that are very similar to how Marx would have talked about religion and she's also aware of the struggle of the problems of socialism and the fact that um, class struggle persists and the fact that real harmony hasn't been reached and she believes in this kind of communist ideal as the sort of moral horizon that gives you hope for the future and that helps you um, short help overcome the shortcomings of the present and so she represents basically the moral victors under socialism and finally uh, this other character from the second part of the book who is in some way similar who has a similar conviction but about a different set of ideas and uh, who is a crocodile, uh, who is called the crocodile because he always wears a shirt with a crocodile on it. He's, as I say, his real name is Vincent van der Berg, but everybody calls him the crocodile. And, uh, and he's also one of the, or he thinks of himself as one of the moral victors because he has brought to Albania true freedom. He has brought the liberation from state socialism and the commitment to a market economy. And, uh, you know, he, nobody knows what the crocodile that he's wearing is and what the logo is. No one knows what it is. But people think that uh, the crocodile is there to remind him of all the places that he's been to, because he's in some ways a kind of cosmopolitan of a liberal kind, you know, he's uh, of, of the kind of kind that tends to be derided, because he never really takes an interest in the particular places that he goes to. He's a Dutchman, but the fact that his Dutch is only important to the Albanians, it's not really important to him. He thinks of himself as someone who has lived in many different countries, and even though he does remember their name, and his mission is the same in all of them. He works for the World Bank, and uh, you know he has his hands dirty in a different way from Nora. His hands are dirty because he's complicit <laughs> in the kind of structural reforms that require the um, liberalization of the country and the privatization of the state sector. 
And so he's like Nora in that they're both internationally minded. They're both fully committed to the ideas that they believe in. And they are also aware of the moral costs of these ideals, but they have also reconciled themselves with these costs, unlike some of the characters in the book. And so they represent, I guess, the kind of people that every system needs in order to survive and to be maintained through this general chain of complicity, regardless of the kind of cracks that there are in every system. And so they're neither completely innocent nor completely uh, blameworthy. And that's why they sort of represent both of them, this kind of dogmatic. Although, I think you're absolutely right that Albania is the limit case because it was extreme versions of both. And I remember at that time how Albania was always touted as the perfect example of structural reform until the pyramid right. system collapsed. Yeah. You know, Albania was the country that had really gone through with everything in the most extreme ways and yet you know, societies which survive and reproduce itself surely don't have need those characters. They have characters who are, who are much more able to compromise, don't they? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you have a bit of both. And this is partly the, I, I guess, the story in both systems. In the socialist case, the story that often gets told from the outside or superficially is that this is a purely oppressive society and a society characterized by pure censorship where there is absolutely no freedom to think even differently. And part of the story that I try to tell in the book is about how, although there are obviously these state structures and there is obviously oppression on the surface, at a deeper level, people are always questioning the categories that they are being given, and they're also finding codes to discuss these issues, even though they're not accessible to someone like me, who is just a child and is just experiencing the uh, life at this, the way, the superficial level in which children experience it and with the kind of children's sensitivity. The adults, however, even in a kind of dissident family like mine, with all the suspicion and with all the compromises that they need to make, with all the concerns that they have about being heard from outsiders and having a spy in the family and so on, they're still finding codes and they're still finding net ways to navigate that pure oppression and that pure censorship. And likely, likewise, also, the people, the citizens, you know, they don't have, they only have access to the news through state television, but then they also watch Italian television and Yugoslav television. And so they get their alternative narratives from these informal sources, which from the outside, you don't necessarily notice and you don't necessarily see. So I think in, I think you're right to say that in both cases, the system survives in part because there are those who are entirely loyal and entirely committed and are reproducing the categories. And then there is many more many other characters, much more complexity on the ground and different ways of telling the story of what goes on in both of these cases that help to, I hope, hope to challenge the kind of narrative, the sort of unified narrative that you might get from the outside about the country in both of these stages. I thought what was really original about your conception of freedom was that it is a kind of individual freedom embedded in all of us and that it was about the ability to rise above um, determined circumstances, whatever the circumstances were, whether they're the circumstances of a tightly controlled state system or a hugely unfair market system. That's what I took from it. And I thought that's rather an exciting idea. And it made me realize why you are a Marxist because I think, and that's often misunderstood about Marx because it was all about the dialectic between agency and structure. <laughs> and, you know, that's what, that's what it, we, we, we got, that's what some of us got from a reading of Marx. So I think that's what's really exciting. In your book, I, I, we were saying beforehand, the one person who really embodies that understanding of freedom is your grandmother. Do you want to say something about her? Yes, so I didn't mention her because I thought we would have a sort of more complex discussion around her <laughs> and her 
of freedom and, and you know what that represents and why I, I find I that is, that conception of freedom is the one that I identify most with and find more attractive both philosophically but also as a foundation for political and social critique and uh, and the reason why I'm more attracted to it and why I find it philosophically more appealing is that she has this conception of freedom as which is neither the negative freedom of my mother nor the sort of positive freedom of my father who both in some ways see the failures of freedom in the institutional systems in which they live or that connect this personal freedom to the institutions in which they live and she has rather this inner i guess conception of freedom which is uh, freedom as moral agency and at the heart of it is the idea that we are free to the extent that we make moral decisions and are able to make these moral decisions while being aware of all the constraints around us and uh, trying to kind of rise above that. And, and Nini, my grandmother, is a good example of that idea because she's on the one hand a sort of direct victim of injustice and her life story embodies this transition from having all the opportunities and having all the power and having the titles and the wealth and so on, being born with them and being born in that privilege and being born with this kind of freedoms that are personally available to her. So she's she comes from this um, aristocratic family in the Ottoman Empire and she's never been to Albania before, but then she moves to Albania and she ends up, you know, first she works for the government and then when the system changes, she ends up being on the side of the oppressed and her husband goes to prison, she's a single mother and she's condemned to uh, forced labor and deportation throughout her the rest of her life. And she neither completely blames others for the plight that she's living under, nor ever completely absolves them because she finds a way of retaining her dignity by explaining how she's always maintained her will and she's asserting her will and making moral decisions, even with what would seem like purely oppressive circumstances. And so she has this kind of conception of freedom as moral agency, which says that as long as, and she always often repeated this to me, she said, and I found this completely perplexing, you know, how can you say that I was always free, I was always the author of my life, you know, you went through all this hardship and you had to make, you know, you didn't have bread to eat or you didn't know how to bring up your child and your son couldn't study what he wanted and so none of the things that you would normally associate to personal freedoms she seemed to say well that's because in all these constraints i found ways of maintaining my dignity and i didn't feel that that was ever taken from me and so there was this kind of internal freedom which no system could completely take away from me and for her that was the basis of the foundation of everything and that what you should aspire to see and to bring about is a kind of society that puts that that conception of freedom at its center so for me that's uh, that was always really interesting and i think rightly you point out that that is also at the heart of this marxist tradition which talks about what is fundamental to human nature and this is partly why uh, i started by saying that i wanted to write this book as a book about freedom in the liberal and socialist traditions and the idea was to talk about socialism as a theory not of equality or not of you know class exploitation or injustice or material relations but rather to talk of it as a kind of theory of human freedom which i always thought radicalizes this liberal commitment to freedom and shows you why it's impossible that in a capitalist world that kind of commodifies people and treats human beings as means to each other it's really impossible to realize this freedom as dignity that that system makes it very difficult in its institutional structures to embody this um this view of the human being and of human agency and what the human species is, is about and so i felt that you're right to say that this uh, marxist critique and in this marxist tradition understood in this way the idea is to bring together the personal and the political by making that conception of personal and moral freedom that my grandmother had the basis for social critique and for an understanding of the systems in which you live and for a kind of for generating perspectives on those systems that hopefully help to challenge it and, and emancipate people you can have moral i mean what your grandmother demonstrated that is that you can have that moral agency in any system but nevertheless you do consider yourself to be a socialist but what kind of socialist um so i i suppose my socialism is a transnational democratic egalitarian socialism yeah. and that's already, that already sets my view of socialism 
completely apart from a, a number of real world socialisms in the sense that, for example, you know, in Albania or in the Soviet Union, a number of socialist countries, the conception of socialism was very closely tied to the socialism of that state and to the fate of that nation. And one of the things that is really important to me is the fact that socialism enables a kind of transnational critique of societies and of the circumstances, because the kind of critique that of capitalism that is at its heart is also transnational. And so the way in which socialism enables you to develop a global critical perspective on the societies that you live, and to also say, look, no country can be fully emancipated, can be fully free, fully democratic, if this is not part of a coordinated effort to bring about this new form of social life and new social relations at a global scale, then it's a failure every time it just limits itself to the nation state. So I guess the, the overlaps between my socialism of now, I suppose, and the kind of real existing socialism is inspiration in the same books and in this kind of critique of capitalism. But on the other hand, I guess my commitment goes further insofar as I'm really interested in democracy as the sort of promise of socialism as well, and not just democracy in a particular state or a particular nation, but understood transnationally. Gosh, it's exactly what I think too. <laughs> the interesting thing, and I mentioned this before, is that I came to it not through complex experiences of the type you have, although I did because of all I was so engaged with Eastern Europe. And as I told you, I went to build socialism in Yugoslavia at the age of 17. But because I remember my mother telling me at the age of six, we are democratic socialists and we're socialists because we think people should be equal and we're democratic because we don't like the way it is in Eastern Europe where my uncle was in prison. And I sort of feel I've never really veered <laughs> from that position, although of course it varied from over time. And it's a very different trajectory than yours, which has gone through all these amazing traumatic episodes. Anyway. Yeah, can I just say something to that? I think that's it's also really important and, and it sort of matters to me as well, because and I say this something along those lines in the book, it's something that also made me in part uncomfortable, but I guess by being uncomfortable forced me to clarify my position, is the fact yeah. that, and, and this was another motivation for writing the book in the way in which I wrote it, is the fact that I, when I became interested in Marx and you know Marxism, the Marxist tradition and so on, people who had grown up in Albania during communism and who had had adult experiences of communism in Albania, like my, not just my mother and my father, but also people who were just a little bit older than me, so five, six, six years older, who had not just had their childhood, but also a chunk of their adulthood in Albania, found it completely perplexing, bewildering, and borderline pathologic that I was interested in Marx and that I was trying to think about, okay, what does Marxism entail? What kind of commitments does it have? Was it, what is its politics? How does socialism relate to democracy? How can you work in this socialist tradition? And to me, it was also very strange because eventually I had discovered that my grandfather had been in prison and for 15 years, and that not only had he been in prison, but that he was actually on the left, that he was a socialist. He had been in the popular front in France, fighting against the fascists. He'd wanted to go to join the Republicans in Spain during the civil war. So he was a kind of committed anti-fascist despite having a fascist father and a committed leftist. And we had at home these uh, notebooks of him when he was in prison, where he was reading books, various books in prison and making notes of them. And one of them was the um, a social history of art. There were other things like the history of England and so on. And these were all leftist books. The books that he was reading in prison, you know, the way he read literature, the way he read art, the way meant that this was someone who had spent 15 years in prison and still thought that there was something to socialism that was not being captured by his experience in that prison and in that country and that there was something more to that tradition than he had actually lived and for which he had suffered. And so when people asked me afterwards, how come you're attracted to these things? In my mind, I thought, well, if my grandfather could be interested in this while being in prison and wanted to see something there and discover something, there must be a part of his story that is not being told. And that is just being kind of buried in the sand or in the mud with this post-1990 narrative of the kind of triumph of liberalism over, and over socialism, because there are all these experiences of socialist dissidents within socialist countries. And there's all these stories that need to be told and to be engaged with in the right way that are just not being told because of this triumphalist narrative of the 90s. 
And so I, I saw my role as kind of going back. And this is why I always said to my mom, look, I'm not doing it to disgrace the family. I feel like I'm doing it to promote these commitments that would otherwise be forgotten and just would have meant nothing. Yeah. That's your next book. I think you should write a book about your grandfather and yeah. read all those notes he wrote in. I think it would make, it would make another prison notebooks. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I think that would I, definitely in my mind as a kind of next project to think about a, a prequel to Free and to talk about what dignity means and how dignity connects to this dissident socialist experience, which we don't hear about and is, as I say, sort of thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. No, that's yeah, absolutely. The other question, I'm not going to go on for a lot longer because I want to let people talk, but I wanted to explain because it's been a great interest of mine. You have a chapter in the book on civil society. And um, I guess I went to Eastern Europe in the 1980s. Uh, I was part of the Western peace movement and it was a part that thought the way to end, get rid of nuclear weapons was to end the Cold War. And the way to end the Cold War was to create a transnational movement of citizens. <laughs> so in a very idealistic way, I went off to Eastern Europe. And there I met all these amazing East European intellectuals who talked all the time about civil society. And I started reading what they wrote. And of course, there conception of civil society was very different from the one you describe in the book. I mean, for them, it was about having autonomous public action, being able to be an independent trades union, being able to be an independent university, being free to debate and deliberate uh, independent of the state. And it was also, interestingly enough, it's something I've gone back to afterwards because uh, of the Western interpretation. It wasn't just about the state, it was always transnational. The sort of real intellectuals talked about this as a global issue, a response to what George Conrad in Hungary called global Auschwitz. And so, you know, it, they saw it as transnational and indeed they said that they could see it more clearly than people in the West because we were subjected to such manip uh, manipulation from the press and from the media and so on. So then suddenly after 1990, everybody talked about civil society. And civil society became what the West had and what it could teach Eastern Europe. And that's how you see this. You have a whole chapter about what it is. That's how you see civil society. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I, I would actually love to talk to you more about it because it's, I will tell you how I see it, but I also want to know how you feel about the appropriation of this discourse. Yeah. Kind of instrumentalization of it and the being put to the service of projects that weren't necessarily the ones that were there in the first instance. So I think one of the most interesting things about civil society in the rest of Eastern Europe is exactly how it began with this kind of wave of activism whose main concern was really democracy. And these pro-democracy movements, I think were not at all pro-capitalist movements. So one of the reasons for writing this book and for writing about freedom in this kind of two traditions was that, again, I wanted to kind of recover a narrative of the dissident movements of the 90s, the 80s and 90s in Eastern Europe, which I think after 30 years has been completely lost because we assume that these pro-democracy movements start with Havel or Solidarność or even, you know, beginning with already with 1956 uh, Budapest, basically. So there was a whole part of the kind of socialist in the socialist country of people who were socialists in their mind who used civil society as a tool of internal of innovation and as a tool of kind of fighting for internal democracy which in their minds was very different from fighting for capitalism and for liberal you know neoliberal structures or neoliberal economic um, uh, institutions and so on the way this came to obey and so then eventually you know 90s came the Cold War was won by the West. 
or at least this was the kind of the narrative was that the West had won and the East was defeated. And with that were also, I think these alternative discourses of democracy and this, let's call it third way in the way in which they would have thought about the third way back then as you know alternatives to state socialism, but also capitalism were completely captured by the market logic and by the neoliberal story about the winning of the Cold War and so on. So when they came to Albania, Albania hadn't really had a civil society movement in those terms, partly because of the censorship and partly because of the, uh, the degree of oppression, the extreme isolation, the way that it had never really been part of these um, internal you know, democracy struggles in these East European countries had left Albania relatively untouched. And when the change came, it was really a change mainly from the party, although with some influence from the student movement and from some sort of prominent intellectuals, but each of which had been in one way or another connected to the party. So it was very much kind of inside the party. And so when this, when the 90s came and the discourse changed, I feel like two ways of understanding civil society became available, but which weren't really continuous with each other. So one was civil society in the way in which you described, and, civil, and the other one civil society in the way in which people talk about civil society in 19th century political thought, you know, Adam Smith or as commercial society. And so, and, and in fact, in German, you have this term, which is civil Gesellschaft, which is the same mm. basically for commercial interactions and for civil society interactions of this democratizing kind. And when these two things became confused, civil society in Albania became a proxy for neoliberalism. And so, mm. and the whole discourse on civil society was, I feel appropriated and put to the service of opening up the economy, rejecting state intervention, rejecting any sense of kind of responsibility, collective responsibility, just individual initiatives and volunteerism, which took civil society to the extreme because everything then became a question of voluntaristic cooperation as opposed to asking the state for help. And so it was used in this kind of anti-state way, in a way which was really devastating in a post-transition or in a transition context, post-socialist context, where you actually needed to keep somehow some state structure so that you wouldn't destroy everything and you wouldn't just go this neoliberal route um, with this huge cost socially that it ended up having. So I actually, so I mean, and, and then it became, of course, by the locals also instrumentalized because it became a source of profit and it was easy to write. I mean, literally the, the, the most vivid association I have with civil society throughout the 90s was of people in Albania who had discovered that if you founded an NGO, you could get some money from an outside corporation, from some kind of sponsor, you know, whether it was Soros or whether it was, I don't know, some other right. international organization or some donor or who, who, what have you, some foreign, basically foreign assistant. So this was in the context of the state collapsing, people losing their jobs, everybody having to make a living in whatever form they could find. And they suddenly discovered that if they put civil society in their projects, they could just get funding. And so the word really, really became a proxy for the way in which the word party had been used until 1990, where it was always saying, well, you know, we have the party, the party does this, the party does that. And in this case, so the party was a kind of mystery solution to everything. In this case, civil society was the mystery solution to everything. And if you just put it that word, then everything would be fine. So, I mean, and, and this, as I said, this is the kind of the most vivid, and it was often instrumental. It was about getting benefits, or it was sometimes it was about just killing time, killing an afternoon when you didn't have anything else to do, you became kind of active in, in civil society. But this is why I started by saying, I'd be really curious to know how you, because I know you have been one of the pioneers of civil society discourse and also of civil society as, you know, the part of this democratizing effort, how you felt about the way you must have noticed this at some point, the way in which this was being instrumentalized and appropriated. And as I say, put to the service of projects that were completely unrelated with their initial intentions, right? And in fact, were distorted and in some ways even in contrast with them. I, well, absolutely. And I completely agree with that analysis. And it was extremely depressing the way the East European conception of civil society uh, was so quickly sidelined. Um, it was interesting really looking back because the key figure in the Western peace movement was Edward Thompson who wrote about history from below. And I remember him writing to me saying, you know, we're playing this key role now in ending the Cold War. And, in a few years, it will be taken over and our role will be completely forgotten. And 
Um, it was very interesting the way Westerners, prominent Westerners, came to Eastern Europe and said all they want to do is to be like us. And they want markets, uh, free elections, and Europe. Those are the three things they want. And actually, in all my discussions with, with people, I, I never, we never really discussed those things. We didn't actually discuss markets. We discussed democracy. And we, but I think more than anything, we discussed the relationship between the state and society. That was the core to our whole discussion. That's what we wanted, they wanted, and we wanted to change. And I think what's very interesting is that a similar conception of civil society was emerging at the same time quite independently in Latin America in opposition to the military dictatorships. And I think both were really influenced by Gramsci, although the East Europeans always denied it. Because if you look at the trajectory of the term, it goes from Hegel through to Marx and then to Gramsci. And actually, uh, the, the term wasn't much used apart from among Marxists um, during the 20th century. Right. Yeah. So, but I think what is interesting still for me, and now maybe I'm talking too much, is that where you find it still has that same sort of resonance is in conflict zones. And what you find is that, um, well, in, in, in Yugoslavia, people would talk about the civic parties as opposed to the national parties. And what you find, whether it's in Afghanistan or Syria, people mean by civil society, autonomous public agency, and they mean an alternative to both corruption and sectarianism. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. So I always played with the idea, can we use the popularity of the term civil society to somehow legitimize this East European meaning? And I think that's become more and more difficult. So I tend now to talk about civicness <laughs> rather than civil society, but you know, it's something that we could discuss further at a further moment. Now, let me look at some of the questions. Um, I'm going to look for, I'm going to take, well, actually, I think you've answered that, a question from somebody called Ursula Zemek, which of these conflicting narratives in your formative years has the biggest impact on you as an adult? I think you've answered that by talking about your grandmother, but I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, I think that's more or less what I said and, and, and for the reasons that I tried to explain, because I think she had this perspective on moral agency, which I felt was really important as the kind of basis for social critique. And I felt that the only thing that was missing in my grandmother is that she always saw this as a personal stance and for me, it's really important to socialize that stance and to also think about how that can become the basis for a more general social critique that is not just limited to saying, well, the individual always retains their dignity. And so therefore, you know, anything can happen, which is not really what my grandmother said, because in her case, it was more of a tool of survival, I suppose. But if you were to, you know, think about how does that conception of moral agency, how does that conception of freedom, how can that be, how can it play a political role? And I think it would need to be coupled with a kind of critique of society that puts human dignity as its center. And that's why it's really important for me, because it's sort of, yeah. That's it's really interesting, because I was, it does relate to what I was just saying about civicness, because in conflict zones, it's everywhere, even though obviously it's the opposite of civicness, what's happening in conflict zones. But it's neighbors helping each other, it's... Well, it's all the things that you describe in your book during communist Albania. <laughs> and the question is, is this a tool for survival or can it also at the same time, and that's what I've been trying to argue, represent the germs of an alternative? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I agree with you that it can definitely, and that's how I see it as well, as I see it as a sort of foundation of an alternative. But I feel that for it to really be the foundation of an alternative, it needs to be connected to institutions and to form. Yeah. Oh dear, we're losing you. Uh, I think we're losing you, or am I being lost? Um, can I ask LSE people, can you hear me? Hi there, this is LSE Events speaking. Um, yes, we can hear you, Professor Calder. Um, perhaps we could just wait a few minutes and see if Leah can rejoin um, when she gets on some better Wi-Fi. Okay, great. Um, I wonder if while she's... Oh, I've now lost, oh no, it was, I was looking at the questions. What was she just saying? Oh, she's back. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I can't remember. And what you were saying something about was it a strategy for survival or the germs of an alternative? Yeah, so that was my, the, the sort of, the, the, my last sentence was about the importance of connecting these instances of individual rebellion to real institutions that could then connect this personal stance to the collective solidarity and to ways of creating channels for solidarity that are also institutional and don't just take this individual form, I suppose, in the way in which yeah, they Yeah, and again, I agree with you. And one of the things I've been talking about with civicness is that civicness also include people within the system who try to behave as if it operates according to a civic logic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now we have another question from David Abu Lafia in Cambridge. What do you think was the balance between coercion and consent in communist Albania? By consent, I don't necessarily mean agreement, just passive acceptance. So I would say that it was, the society was mainly a coercive society and that it legitimized mainly through coercion. But the, one of the stories that I tell, so I'm not going to, you know, give numbers in terms of, or percentages in terms of what percentage was consent and what percentage was coercion. It was mostly a coercive society. It was brutal at the point in which I was growing up in the 80s because it was completely isolated. There were points in the history of Albania where different compromises had been made within the party and between different elites within the party, which meant that my grandmother, my mother, for example, she remembers very fondly the period of alliance with the Soviet Union because she thinks that things were a bit softer then and there were more margins of freedom than compared to, you know, afterwards. There's other people that will talk about, you know, when we were in an alliance with China. So I guess one of the stories that I want to talk about in the book when I talk about these different periods of Albanian history was to emphasize that even though this was primarily a coercive society, and even though coercion was brutal, there were still degrees of, uh, there was leeway in how society coerced, which often depended on these internal debates within the party, and that sometimes one group won, sometimes another group won. The cost of one group winning was the purge of the other groups, but the fact that that group, that there was a kind of internal debate which led to that conflict and that led to that power balance meant that there were also, that there was also a degree with which the country or the party ruled with this passive acceptance that you mentioned. So I'd say that, you know, it was mostly coercive, but it was also important to me to tell the story of how no regime, however coercive it is, can ever survive through pure, pure coercion. That in every system, however coercive it is, there are always margins of dissidence and margins of internal critique, which are really important to keep in mind when people engage with those systems from the outside. 
and in fact, again, you know, when you think about humanitarian intervention or when you think about how people engage with post with with conflicting uh, scenarios or with societies that are facing internal rebellion or unrest and so on, I think it's really important to realize that in every society there are dissidents. In every society there is an internal critique and to engage and understand the form that that internal critique takes before offering solutions and alternatives that might or might not match the reality on the ground. And so this was one, you know, Albania never came to humanitarian intervention of the way in which, you know, it was taken in Bosnia or in Kosovo or whatever. But it's, um, I think it's really important to know that there is always a balance of course and coercion and consent in this way in which you describe what consent is, meaning passive acceptance, even if it doesn't mean fr freedom of expression or freedom of thought or whatever. I, yeah, and that's the point that Anna Hannah Arendt makes in that wonderful essay, I don't know if you know it, uh, on power and on violence it is. And her argument is that power can never depend on violence. It always depends on some degree of legitimacy. There's some wonderful questions here, so I'm going to ask them. Uh, I, can't get, I can't fit them all in. Um, Uh, this is amazing. This is from Andre Gomez Suarez. Um, thanks, Leah. Are the characters outside your family fictional? Did you ask your family for permission to tell their story? Did you consider anonymizing them or other characters to protect them? Yes. So all the characters outside my family are uh, not fictional, they're real, but they're anonymized. And so nobody would be able to recognize themselves. There wouldn't be anyone from my friends, for example, or the people that I haven't talked to uh, that would be able to recognize themselves. Sometimes, although all the stories in the book are true, sometimes there were things that happened to many different characters that are kind of for purposes of narrative clarity condensed into one character and so there is a kind of for example when i talk about my friend there could be a dialogue that happened between several friends that is kind of condensed into as a dialogue between one or two friends as opposed to you know several um the only members of so the only people who are not fictional are the members of my family and the only surviving members of my family are my mother and my brother who I had both asked if they were okay and both read the book before it was published and could actually tell me, you know, correct any inaccuracies or tell me when they felt I had misrepresented them. In general, I try to be uh, very careful with, rep with how I was talking about characters. And this is partly why, as I said, there is no dominant narrative voice in the book because I wanted each of the characters to speak and to relate to the reader in the way in which they would have related to, to the reader if they had been telling their story as opposed to me telling my story. Now that's in the choice of topics, in the construction of the chapters, in the way in which you build structure, that's not completely something that an author can control. You know, it's not, obviously if my mother were to write this book, she would write it very differently. She would put, you know, the chapters would break down in a different way. She would have highlighted maybe different episodes and so on, but she did consent. And indeed, you know, I felt at some point, especially with the Albanian translation, like I was going in front of the inquisition because she was there with a black mark and black pen, just taking out sentences. And, but I felt that was sort of fair and, and respectful because she's a character, but she's also a real person with her feelings and her, you know, her, her sensitivities and her views of the world. So I felt that if they are going to be part of this of, of the story and of the book, they need to have a say in it. And so the, 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 the characters that are real were all asked and all checked and everything that I wrote was endorsed by them. The, the rest are not uh, are fictional in the sense that they wouldn't, they're anonymized, they wouldn't recognize themselves. Did she like the book despite her black marks? Um, that's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer <laughs> to that question. <laughs> She hasn't said she hates it. Um, it's, uh, I often say, you know, if someone wants to write, the book has had amazing reviews so far. There hasn't been a single negative review or a single skeptical review yet even. So I sometimes joke that if someone wants to write a skeptical review, they can talk to my mother and she'll give them lots of, you know, lines of this is not beautiful enough or it's not, you know, this sentence is not, doesn't sound right. Uh, she didn't actually, object sort of ideologically or she, she read it and she recognized that this was my perspective and this was my interpretation. She didn't have any political criticism. I think it's just that as a piece of literature she just has other tastes and she, she likes more like uh, 
I don't know, um, she, she's a big fan of John Goldsworthy and the, uh, I don't know how it's translated in English, how, how it, uh, what the title is in English, the apple flowers or something like that. Anyway, my mother likes very flowery prose and very not, you know, straight and philosophical. She has just different literary tastes. So I feel like her book, my book, from a literary perspective is not up her street, but at least she didn't have problems with it from a political perspective. She was obviously wanted. okay with the story of her wearing the nightdress when the American French delegation came and her telling yeah. them the story of carrying a knife. Yeah, she totally, <laughs> like she, she took out the sentences that she didn't like. So, you know, that all of that had passed the Inquisition. I felt like, you know, Galilei in front of the Pope with my book saying, mom, is this okay? Are you okay with it? <laughs> but yeah, on the whole, she, I don't, I mean, I don't think she necessarily agrees with all, everything in my take of the world, but she certainly recognized herself and she felt that it was an accurate representation of her, of her politics and of her views. And I think in places she was quite pleased with it, actually. So. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, it seemed to me you were closer to your father, but obviously you were closest of all to your grandmother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very, I mean, I was extremely close to my grandmother and, and, and I feel like with my mother, I've sort of, my relationships gets better and better with her. And in some odd way, this book has made it even better than it was. So it's, it's a That's nice thing. Lovely. <laughs> um, this is from Emma Obermeyer, an LSE alumna. Very interesting book, Leia. Look forward to reading it. I wonder to what extent the different perceptions of freedom and which perception one adopts might matter to how global challenges like the climate crisis can be tackled, i.e. where we place individual freedom responsibility within the structure system? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, so I have my views on, on how, you know, how to answer that question, but I don't want my views to, uh, you know, if by, 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 by clarifying, by sharing my view here, there is a risk that I make people read the book in a certain way. And so I would rather, what the point that I would make about how this book might help contrib might contribute to understanding these questions is to say, look, I feel that when we're talking about climate change and when we're talking about the point at which we are now in, I guess, the liberal core capitalist West, this is a point where a lot of people are challenging the system and they're asking them questions about the system and the societies in which they live. And I feel it helps to, when you question the system to be as critical as you can and as non-dogmatic as possible and to have your views around that system not shaped by kind of dominant narratives and dominant ideologies. So my book in many ways tells a story about how the categories that you are offered in society, whether it's when at the point of changing or whether it's in transition or the categories that you grew up with or that you were socialized into are the glasses through which you look at reality. And sometimes these glasses are accurate and sometimes they're not so accurate. And in fact, often we think, we just take these categories for granted and we read events and politics and we interpret you know, characters with these kind of ideological glasses that we have. And sometimes it helps to kind of pause and ask yourself, well, to what extent are these narratives, these ideologies that we endorse, to what extent do they support the status quo? And is it the status quo that they're supporting? Is it a good one? Is it worth supporting? Does it reflect moral agency? And does it realize dignity in the way in which I would like it to realize dignity? So for me, it helps to ask these kind of foundational questions about the system in which we live. And I suppose with environmental change, with all the kinds of crises that we talk about, where we talk about the relationships between individuals and agency and structures and, and agency, it's always helpful to not see either side of the story as the dominant one. So it's helpful to see that individual solutions are always good, but limited, but that it's also important to see that there aren't just structural stories and that there are margins of freedom within this sort of structural story. So it helps, I suppose, or I hope my book helps to see the relationship between individuals and, and larger social structures and to see how these sort of interactions enact certain conceptions of freedom and to question these conceptions of freedom and their appropriateness. So. Oh, I think that's so interesting. I was just another thought that occurred to me, although I'm going to come back to the questions because there are lots of really interesting ones, was that actually we are going through another turning point like 89. 
And I was thinking when Boris Johnson was going on about how we've got to go through all the pain of Brexit to get from this low wage, low productivity economy to the Brexit paradise, how similar it was to what you were saying about the way shock therapy replaced communism <laughs> as a story of why you have to experience pain. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that there is a parallel with 89 in terms of questioning the system. What I feel there isn't, and maybe was there in 89, was a kind of coordinated action and things that were happening in many countries at the same time to really try and change things, uh, regardless of you know how that whole thing then ended up being appropriated, and as we were saying earlier, also mis misappropriated and misused. But I feel what we're lacking now is there is a sense of crisis and there is a pervasive discontent with the societies in which we live and there's movements that challenge the system in many different ways but i feel what we lack is a kind of coherent unified moral vision that isn't just for a particular country or a particular group within that country but that is a sort of more coordinated global vision that would help all of us make progress in in some ways that are as i say coordinated and i feel like we're lacking that and we're lacking also agents that are able to do that all the interventions that we have politically are piecemeal interventions. They always take place within particular states, within particular representative system. I don't think the electoral systems that are always done and organized and the way in which democracy is understood in this sort of national terms helps with that. And you know, if, even if you think about the challenges of the EU, for example, to me, it's really damaging that the challenges of the EU then take you in a place like endorsing nationalism or endorsing this kind of ethnically uh, homogeneous narratives about what needs to be done to overcome the obstacles and there isn't really a transnational critique of the EU or a transnational emancipatory movement which I feel what is what needs to be there for these visions to take a constructive form as opposed to just a kind of nostalgic rejective and uh, I suppose borderline I, I, I do agree with you again <laughs> and I think you know there is I think a transnational emancipatory movement uh, but it's very um, narrow in a way. I mean, I think I know lots of, there's at the moment lots of citizens' assemblies taking place in Europe in which people who are left, transnational and green are all taking part. But what you're finding is that the dominant left is quite um, old fashioned and statist <laughs> and nationalist. And so there being that kind of group of emancipatory people are, are in a way in a minority at the moment. So it makes it terribly, terribly difficult. I think 89 was interesting because it was the confluence of two things. On the one hand, it was the coming together of the post-68 movements, which were all about peace and women's rights and human rights. But on the other hand, at the same time, you've had the development of neoliberal ideas and they somehow came together in a way that seemed OK at the time because we were people like me thought we'd won on social justice and we needed to fight on democracy issues, but actually has taken us backward in a most terrifying way. And now we're going through this crisis, which it's very difficult to see how we're going to navigate our way through. Yeah, I mean, I also feel that, the, to just to add to that, with which I agree, I feel like there is also real institutional and structural constraints on representation that make it very difficult. So the fact that the only spaces, the only margins of representation that we have with the real possibility of making laws and you know shaping policies and so on are always nation national spaces. And that you know the party system takes this national form that parties contend for elections. So that means that you can have a transnational movement, but if the transnational movement then who always has to fragment and divide into however many countries are part of it and then fight for elections in these countries and the electoral cycles are all over the place and you know the initiatives aren't coordinated, that is just destructive and frankly really, really hard. So I don't really know what one can do without really changing the basis of representation, without uh, you know, really changing the structures of representation, actually. I completely agree. And actually, this is what I'm working on at the moment. So I, I, we, at another moment, we must sit and talk about it all. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think this is why, for me, the European Union is potentially <laughs> so yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, agree. So for me, 
I mean, just to add on that, it's not, you know, we're not really, that's not really the topic and people maybe don't want to hear my views about the EU, but I really feel the same that the EU gives you this huge opportunity for reconceiving citizenship and understanding participation in a different way. What I feel it's really missing is the kind of strong radical critique of the kind of economic foundations that shape it and that it needs, a, you know, that you need to put the critique of capitalism at the heart of how you understand the EU and how you want to the EU to change and in what direction it needs to change, coupled with an understanding that there are these structures of representation that are potentially really useful and really democratically empowering. Yeah, no, and I agree with that too, although I do think in the last election, if you read the Socialist Party manifesto, it was much closer to that than I've ever seen it before. It was called Europe for the many. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. No, I, I agree with you. And it's true. I mean, also the even in Germany, the SPD, or there is a sense in which some of these kind of traditional left wing parties are changing and sort of waking up to the reality of really questioning the, the system in more radical ways than they have done before. So I think that's sort of maybe a ground for hope. Anyway, here's another interesting question from Javier Ramiro Poveda Figueroa. Um, I have one question. Do you think that through literature you can access to objectivity? The narrative developed in your book seems to show an interesting relationship between objectivity and subjectivity. In this case, the reconstruction of the main character of her reality through the relationship with other human beings. Yeah, so this is a really good question. I think I mean, it is possible, I guess, through literature to aspire to access objectivity, but I don't think it's a desirable form of literature that which tries to convey all the commitments of the author and to kind of clarify all the views and all the, uh, and in some way, I don't think, I think the most interesting types of literature are the ones that trigger in the reader an approach that makes them discover objectivity as opposed to trying to be objective and to you know represent reality in a way that is accurate and that conveys through the different characters real perceptions of reality and so on. so i feel like um i think i'm really interested in literature and it literature has played a really important role in my life and still does as a way of thinking about ideas that is more open and possibly gives you more freedom in exploring than if you say do things philosophically where you say well this is the argument these are this is my position this is my stance on this and these are the three objections that need to be defeated and this is my conclusion and part of the reason why i mean obviously i do that in my other work as well but part of the reason why i've always been interested in literature is especially when things are messy and complex and contentious i feel you need more of a dialogue with the reader as opposed to just sort of as an author say what you believe and what how the reader should read this book and what they should take away what you need is to kind of create a thought process and a way of engaging with the work that makes the work continue to live even after it's finished and what i think great literature does is it sort of it becomes part of people's lives and people can continue to refer to them continue to refer to the examples continue to think about the questions that it provoked in them not as things that gave them solutions but as as i say questions that kind of live with them and, and make them question uh, reality or make them question the world in which they live and the societies in which they live in ways that i think are more productive if they're ongoing as opposed to being really settled yeah, and so I think this is such an interesting issue. I remember there was, when I was much younger, a great philosophical debate about can you only tell the truth in fiction? But what I do find is whether I'm teaching about Eastern Europe or about contemporary wars, I sort of do make the students read novels because I think it's only through novels that you get a real feeling <laughs> of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's right. And you sort of get it's, it's, it's as though you live with the characters and you kind of identify and you have these degrees of identification that make you perceive things and and experience them in a different way from how you do that when you're reading history or when you're watching the documentary or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, I'm, it's another question from somebody who looks as though they might, oh, but, but, well, I'll ask that afterwards, who looks as though they might be Albanian, but I'm not sure. Liri Kuchi, Kutsi. Um, 
since dear Lair, thank you for this masterpiece. I enjoyed your charismatic and stylistic narrative. Since the book is written in two main times, the little Lear and the conscious one, active and engaged in a post-communist society, what would be the expectations of little Lear, Lair compared to your point of view as a professor about the book in Albania? It seems like there is some sensitivity to the narratives that can somehow awaken the collective memory, which most people want to keep suspended as a defense mechanism. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, Liri is actually Albanian, hi, and, and actually Liri in Albanian means freedom, so <laughs> it's good and appropriate. She's got a beautiful name and is a beautiful person. Uh, so the, I suppose, Little Lea is just a narrative device in a way. So she's there to tell the story in a way that can help the author convey certain perspectives, but without really conveying the interpretation or this, it helps the author convey events and structure the book and shape the narrative of the book without giving an interpretation, which was the hardest thing to do when I wrote the book. It was really hard to write the book as a philosopher, as a political theorist, who is used to talking about theories all the time and has certain very strong views on, you know, which theories are right and which are wrong and how to think about democracy, how to think about, uh, you know, capitalism, socialism, all these things. And to, and for me, Little Lea was kind of the protection against my old now self and the device that I sort of came up with to try and stop myself from telling the reader, you know, you have to believe this or you have to see it this way, you have to see it that way. So I used it because I was very, I was initially committed and I wanted to write the book from the point of view of a child because I, I think there is something in the kind of innocence of childhood which can observe but doesn't really have mature views about politics or about life or about society. And I wanted this, especially the part about communism to be mainly an observation and to just let people draw conclusions in part because it's such a contested period of Albanian history. People have so many different views on it and it's very difficult emotionally for a number of them to process it. It's a very, it was very tricky in my family. So there's a number of both personal, political and, and social reasons for why the child is telling the story in this, uh, in this first part of the book. And as I say, for me, it was really helpful to have the child tell the story because by thinking, okay, I need to stick, would the child have thought this? Would the child have said this? It helped me always stand back and not shape the narrative in a way in which would have forced it or imposed my interpretation. Having said that, I do think there is a kind of general lesson in the book about, or well, not a lesson, but maybe there is a general reflection or attempted at a reflection on how to think about these different periods of Albanian history and how to kind of assess them critically and to kind of be, I guess, try to be as little biased as possible when assessing them, which is, I hope, what people in Albania will take away. And so in that sense, I think you're right that there is a sense in which it might help to awaken, I wouldn't use the word awaken, this is quite strong, but to alert people to a possibility of reading their stories and their lives and, and, and the society that they have lived through by looking at it from another perspective from how they have looked at it throughout their lives. And so I hope the, the whole book and its complexity and its entirety does that. One of the things that completely amazed me when I went to Albania in 1991 was how many people spoke foreign languages. It was yeah. especially Italian, of course, and you mentioned that they listened to Italian but, you know, in, in a curious way, they were incredibly knowledgeable about what went on in the rest of the world, which you, I didn't expect. Yeah, so this is, again, one of these things that I think people don't know about Albania, looking at it from the outside, and maybe a number of isolated societies, a, a lot of isolated societies, because they're isolated, they have a yearning to know more and to, uh, and, and, and to do more with concepts and ideas and places and images that come from other countries. So one thing about Albania that was also for me really interesting was how Albanians were completely isolated. They could never travel, they couldn't go anywhere, but they read so many books and if they got obsessed with one place, they would just read everything about their place, watch every film there was to watch. And so I remember in, in 1990, we had a cousin who was obsessed with Rome. He'd never been to Rome, but he just read everything about Rome, like ancient Rome, modern Rome, modern Italian history and so on. And so when he met some Italians, 
he was telling them, oh, by the way, do you still go from the Colosseum to the Altare della Patria this way? And then you turn right and then you move to the Piazza del Popolo. And you could never tell that this person has actually never left Albania in the detail, in the kind of complexity with which he was explaining this, you know, where this road was and what there wasn't. And is there still that shop? And is there, are there still those, you know, people selling this and selling, which he knew only from films and from, you know, documentaries or from news news items or whatever whatever he had access to to develop this knowledge of Rome <laughs> and so it was incredible that you could actually have this degree of not just knowledge but complex knowledge about you, a place you'd never been to and I feel the same goes on with language so has always been like the more languages you knew the, the better person you were somehow <laughs> and everybody was trying to learn more languages and yeah. yeah, it's just incredible. And your father knew five languages, but unfortunately not English. Did his English get better towards the end of his life? Yeah, only very, by the very end of his life, only a little bit through the internet. I mean, that was the next thing that I didn't get around to talk in the book, but like he's, eventually he sort of overcame his trauma with English. And then the next thing became the internet and the computer and the fact that, you know, he couldn't do the emails, but now everybody was going through email and doing things with email. So he always felt that he had to kind of catch up with technology, what was going faster than him. But yeah, it did, it did get a little bit better because he forced himself to learn so much. And... That's incredible. Um, and I love the story about him learning from the Mormons. <laughs> yeah, I feel that, that what's amazing also about the story for, about the Mormons that was kind of completely extraordinary when I remembered it back was the fact that there were these so many Muslims in the Mormons learning English from the Mormons and trying to convert the Mormons to Islam. <laughs> And so they came, they had these discussions about, I think he's kind of becoming a bit more now. I think he sort of sees that Muhammad is just a prophet. You know, you can't say you're the son of God. How can you be the son of God? <laughs> so all these Muslims who were convinced that the reason Islam was superior was that it was a religion that came last and therefore had more historic knowledge. And they were desperately trying to convince the Mormons of this very fact. <laughs> you know? That's wonderful. Now, here's an interesting question question from somebody who has a Chinese last name, Ruodi Liu. I'm Chinese, but Marxism for me is somehow alien. Your sharing renewed my interest. What do you think about Marxism in China? Yeah, I don't think I can answer that question. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> because I don't know enough about Marxism in China. All I know about it is from the Albanian perspective on Marxism in China, which was the Cultural Revolution and Mao and uh, and the fact that, you know, eventually when things changed and China went uh, a different way, Albania was no longer interested in China and indeed kind of split up with uh, the, the, the Chinese. So I don't know enough about it. I do know a little bit about the Chinese students that I have at the LSE who seem to be all to have very interesting perspectives on both China and Marxism, a lot of which are sophisticated in precisely the ways in which Mary and I were talking earlier in the ways in which the kind of the activists of 1989 had views about their system and the societies that were not, that you couldn't flatten to one particular understanding. But I think it's not my place and I shouldn't really say, you know, what, I, I should really assess or, or give a judgment because I know so little and I haven't really engaged with it enough to to give you a, a sort of informed and interesting view on it. So I can only give you this anecdotal, I can only share my enthusiasm from the way in which I see Chinese students at the LSE, for example, being interested in Marxism and on different understandings of Marxism that seem to in some ways depart from what they learn in China and their desire to engage with it in a different way and to bring it back to their society. And yeah, so, and, and oh, so that's I hope- that's exciting. That's really exciting. Productive dynamics, so yeah. <laughs> So this is from John Newham, a London University graduate. How do you foresee the next two decades for Albania, e.g. relations with neighbours, especially Kosovo, possible EU membership? And I also add um, Macedonia, because at the moment, both Macedonia and Kosovo have got rather progressive leaderships. <laughs> anyway, yeah. let, let you reply. Yeah, although the Macedonian prime minister resigned yesterday, so I don't oh, know what, what, oh, dear. What, what leadership they'll get now. They, yes, they lost local elections twice, and so that brought the Zaev to, to resign yesterday. And, and Kosovo, the local elections, although I agree with you that the current government is progressive and I quite like the prime minister, the local elections didn't go as well. And so they also obviously haven't been helped by being 
uh, in government for the first time in a pandemic with these all these emergencies one after the other because it was a party that came from a social movement that is now trying to govern and it's obviously very hard to make this transition so more generally I guess, and, and I'm not in Albania, so I'm not sort of, and I usually try to be very careful with how I assess the political situation in Albania because I'm not, I'm not there. For me, the, sh the thing that shapes debates in Albania right now is this prospect of EU accession, which I find is a mixed blessing because on the one hand, like Mary, I kind of, I believe in the EU as a project and I think it's a really important force in the region and it's important to have these institutions and to try and work with the institutions that we have to try and improve them and so on. The way in which the accession negotiations, well, they haven't even opened, the way in which they say the, the accession process is conducted in the Balkans, just as it was in Eastern Europe, I think has a lot of problems, which have to do with the fact that people have this great faith in the EU as this kind of messianic, emancipatory enriching force that will solve all the problems of Albanian democracy, economy, politics, society, you know, the minute we're part of the EU, all will be fine for us. And as we know from other countries in Eastern Europe, that is not the case. And in fact, when the debate around accession is conducted in those terms, which sees the EU as, you know, the religion of Albanians now, it doesn't help internal democracy because it kind of stifles political activism of the right kind. And in fact, it, I think it kind of prevents a meaningful political exchange. Every political exchange becomes either did you do the right homework or did you not do the homework to become part of the EU, or it becomes just personal exchanges and you know discourses around corruption that don't really connect to any structural dimensions and developments and so on. So I feel that the EU is in some ways a good thing for Albania because I feel like you know we won't, obviously it's important to be part of the EU and it does play a progressive role. But the way in which the debate around accession is conducted makes Albanian blind to the realities of the EU beyond Albania and to the kind of institution that it is and to the problems that it has. They never engage with the problems. They only see the good, the, the good sides of the EU. They never see the fact that it's not a democratic institution, that it has all these concerns that it kind of comes with that need to be worked with. And so it's as though they push back all these debates. And so when they're not there, there is no meaningful exchange about the EU in the country. And then when they're there, it becomes a bit like Poland and, and Hungary. You know, there is everything that every promise that was promised and doesn't deliver turns into kind of backfires and people turn against the EU because they're like, well, how come we're not doing so well since, you know, the EU was going to be our solution. So I feel like the the debate around that is, is quite complex and uh, about the, you know, same, same thing with, I, I feel like, um, with Kosovo, there is now this very interesting discussion around, you know, the Open Balkans initiative and whether there should be regional integration, what form regional integration should be and so on. And I'm generally sympathetic to having these debates and to, uh, to, to having this kind of process in the region that in some ways tries to disentangle these debates around, you know, Kosovo, Albania, Serbia, Macedonia from the process of EU accession, because I think it's helpful to engage with your neighbors beyond how you think mediated by the EU. I think we're coming to an end. There are still some wonderful questions and comments. I just thought I might mention one. Hi, this is from Bessim Gagori. Hi, Lea. I'm someone who has lived the other side of Enver Hodges' communist wall in Kosovo. And I remember vividly enjoying watching Albanian TV in 1981 and enjoying every bit of it because it was different from, quotes, decadent Yugoslav TV. It gave you the impression that Albania was a Shangri-La and actually it was the opposite, but we didn't know that back then. This didn't last long. The Yugoslav regime stopped it. They put some robust TV blocking system. I bought your book and I look forward to reading it. So actually it would be kind of nice to hear stories from all over the place, from the Chinese speaker and all of these on their different interpretations. Maybe we should sort of start a kind of network of people talking about their different interpretations of freedom. Anyway, I found this wonderful and stimulating and thank you so much, Leah, for writing the book do you have any last words you'd like to add uh no i mean just on this very last question and, and actually on what you said about the last question one of the the, the the nicest thing for me about writing the book especially after the kind of 
painfulness of bringing out all these personal memories and about writing about people that weren't there and writing about people I was very fond of who weren't there and sort of having bringing them to life in some ways in the pages and then realizing that they weren't alive this was emotionally very complex and very difficult for me uh it's the one of the nicest things about writing this book has been the way it's made me connect with former children from former communist countries and seeing the many ways in which, even though we lived very different experiences all over the world, you know, from, I don't know, Vietnam, China, Albania, the Soviet Union, there was something about this ex-child, ex-communist pers perspective, which, and there were some overlaps. And so for, I felt like I was connecting with all these different life stories and paths and institutional experiences through the book, which was an amazing feeling, which I had never had with my other work before. And so, yeah, that, and so, and, and so, getting the stories from Kosovo and how they perceived Albania or the Soviet Union, how they saw Albania, all these kind of exchanges are a really nice part of the reception of the book and which I really cherish and really enjoy and really love to hear from, from people. You're right. And I think there's something lovely about the point you made about being a child, being different from those who were more grown up, who became, I think, committed liberals as a way of denying their complicity with the past. Yeah. which you didn't yeah. really have to feel as a child. It didn't matter as a child yeah. if you yeah. were complicit. Yeah. With exactly. the I think that's right. Exactly. And that's maybe why I guess you could approach this whole experience with a different perspective, which is both more troubling for those who are older than you, but nice in a way in which it makes you connect to these other childhoods and other countries. Yeah. And but also you makes you able to connect, because I think one of the frustrating things for people like me in Eastern Europe is that it was the difficulty of connecting as a socialist and a democrat yeah 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 exactly yeah In so that's also that... really nice <laughs> well that's wonderful thank you so much we could obviously go on forever but we'll have to finish another day thank uh, you thank you thank you so much for joining me and for this conversation which i really enjoyed and thank you to everyone <laughs>